20th century crime writer into the 21st century, I guess. Uh, and he wrote mostly in dialogue. He's very famous for his dialogue, sort of, you know, tough guy dialogue that tells, you know, tells the story largely through conversation with relatively little uh, action. So I just said, write a crime story in the manner of George B. Higgins. I mean, that's what I came to in the end. I, um, you know, I started with, you know, with a lot of stuff like I, I was giving it chunks of George V. Higgins and stuff like that, but it, it would just get hooked on the stuff I gave it and it couldn't, it didn't um, go anywhere new with it. Whereas this seems to come up with a new thing pretty much every time, but it does actually seem to know about uh, George V. Higgins. So yeah, Teddy said, I mean, you can imagine this. This would not be a bad beginning to a story. Teddy said, I don't want to do this. I said, you don't have a choice, Teddy. You're going to do it, and you're going to like it. Teddy is my brother-in-law, and I'm the one who's going to make him do what he doesn't want to do. He's a good guy, a little slow, but otherwise okay, and he owes me a favor. I know he doesn't want to hurt anybody, but that's not up to him. It all started with Artie. Artie was always into something bad, always getting into trouble. We grew up together in South Boston. Wow, it really is like George B. Higgins. And I can tell you that nobody ever did anything without Artie being in on it. If there was money to be made, Artie was in the middle of it. If there was violence to be had, Artie was leading the charge. And when I say violence, I'm talking about serious violence. Guns, knives, baseball bats, you name it. The guy was practically fearless. But even among all that craziness, Artie stood out. There was something about him that just made people afraid of him, either other, even other criminals. That's I'm going to have to Google that and see if that is, isn't actually just George V. Higgins, because that's like I'm I, I, that's that's uh, I'm going to save that. Um, uh, uh, let's call this good. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, he, uh, 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 we'll go, we'll go on here. Whoop. Now it's just doing the same thing again. Huh. I wonder what that's about. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Inject start text. Teddy said, this is a holdover actually from, uh, an earlier version of this. Um, so I'm going to get rid of the, the start prompt, and we'll talk about how those formulations work, but we'll just start right from the end here. Killed him execution style, three bullets in the back of the head. I also had to turn off the thing that warns me about, like, uh, risky material or whatever, or offensive material, because literally everything I had the machine write was uh, wow. That's that's really weird. That 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 um, that astonishes me. That's a way better response than I expected to get. But like I say, these single shot prompts seem to work pretty well. And then I tried to build um, an exquisite corpse. If you all know what that is. Um, which is, you know, exquisite corpses where you, you, you pass, and this is not exactly exquisite corpse, right? But you pass around a piece of paper, each person writes a couple of sentences and then just leaves, you know, part of one sentence um, exposed. And then the next person continues the story, but without being able to see the whole, the whole thing. Um, and so I, you know, this is, this is not a, not a, it's not really exquisite corpse. It's just cooperative. But so somebody name a, a genre of story. Mystery. Mystery. Yes. All right. This is a mystery story. I don't know if I could spell. That would be better. All right. So here we go. Uh, the AI will supply the start and every other sentence. So here we go. When I saw something strange. Um, uh, 
course it was. I picked it up and started it tied to a nearby tree. Mm, let's see. So you can see it just, you know, it kind of, you know, it gives you a response and it you, you can guide the story or not guide the story. Um, and you can see how that works. If you look over here on the right, right, the engine is Tex Da Vinci 001. And I would say just generally speaking, since we don't have heavy usage of this, go ahead and use the Da Vinci engine. It's the most sophisticated engine, also the most expensive. Um, temperature, which it controls randomness. I tend to uh, uh, drive it pretty far up when I'm doing a fiction thing or a creative thing. Um, it, it's anywhere between zero and one, and I usually put it at a, about 0.9 for something I want to be interesting. Response length, I've just tried to give it a, you know, 512, 256, whatever. I think 64 is the, um, the default, but I try to give it a little more room. But you can see, generally speaking, it limits its responses to about the length of my responses. These are the two stop sequences that I give it, right? So that when it hits one of these, it stops, yeah? Um, top P, I'm still not really sure. Controls diversity via nucleus sampling. I don't, I don't really know what that means. Um, frequency penalty, I usually leave right about in the middle for each of these, presence penalty and frequency frequency penalty, so it doesn't repeat itself too much, and it still repeats itself like mad. And then inject start text, I did, um, you know, a return, and then AI colon, which means, you know, you can see over here, it always starts AI. And if you wanted to start it with yourself, you would do you and AI, but here it's, um, it's AI and you, because the AI starts. And that just means that every time it types out you, um, it stops rather than just filling in for you. Um, and so that's, that's how that stuff uh, works. Let's see if there's anything else. Um, does a pretty good job. This is a few shot uh, here. Um, I don't know if you know the novel Ridley Walker, but it's a really very fine novel from 1986. It's, it's, a, it's a, a profound um, uh, book of, of post-apocalyptic fiction. And the first, the, the, first, um, uh, uh, the first paragraph is, on my naming day when I come 12, I gone front spear and killed a wild boar. He'd probably been the last wild pig on the bundle downs anyhow. There hadn't been none for a long time before him, nor ain't looking to see none again. And you go, okay, let's see, let's see how it does with that. Um, so we'll see. So it was a good kill and it, and, and it give me a name that it, that is. I don't understand that exactly. They call me Ridley Walker now. That's my name. I carry it with me always. It come to me that day when I killed the pig. That's pretty good, right? I mean, that, you know, that's, uh, it, it, it was a good name and I like it. And so that's, it just considers that kind of the end of this uh, uh, exchange, apparently. And I, I get a little frustrated sometimes when it just sort of ends without, um, you know, my really wanting it to end. I wanted to try myself here and see if it knew. So write a scene from a rural short story by award-winning West Virginia writer Pinkney Benedict. And let's see what it can do here. <laughs> That's actually really goddamn good. The old man coughed and hacked up a lung. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> years of coal dust and smoke had taken their toll, and pneumonia was slowly killing him. The doctor had come out to the cabin a week ago and said there was nothing more he could do. He had given the old man some morphine to ease his pain, but it only made him delirious. The young woman sat beside the bed, holding his hand and talking to him softly. She knew he couldn't hear her, but she didn't know what else to do. The sun was setting, casting a pink and orange glow through the window. A rabbit hopped by outside, pausing to look in at the old man before continuing its on its way. That's a really nice objective correlative right there. The door opened, and the young woman looked up as her sister walked in with a plate of food. I brought you something to eat, she said, as she set it down on the bedside table. Thank you, the young woman replied quietly. I mean, that's a perfectly competent beginning to a story I would write. That's a, that, you know, that's not a, that's not a bad, uh, that's not a bad beginning at all. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, quick. A quick question then. Sure, yeah. Since we were talking about that, um, where it was getting it. So can you confirm that that isn't your writing and it did create uh, No, it? I can confirm. I've never written anything like that. Okay. Um, then that makes me a lot more excited because I, I was putting in two, the, my prompts were not um, as effective as they could have been. I kept getting the error message. So it's cool to see that it actually does just create. No, no, I mean, that that's, you know, no, that's totally original. And I'm, like I say, I'm really impressed by the way it used the rabbit, right? That, that it, it, it kind of looked up, it opened the world up from the immediate, right? And most writers concentrate on the immediate to the exclusion of anything else. And, um, and, and you know, so, so it gave us that rabbit as a, you know, a sign that there was life, there is something some kind of life still going on. So this is King David. I said, write a psalm in the style of King David of Israel. And it did that, and it does that great. Like, I mean, they really, you know, they, they just read like psalms, yeah? Um, but then I thought, okay, but let's throw it a, let's throw it a curveball, include the fact that David, King David was deeply afraid of cats. Um, and, you know, you, that could be whatever you, you know, whatever you wanted, right? So let's see. Well, where's my, <laughs> okay, so literally it just gave us uh, 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 Psalm uh, 23. I mean, that's, that is just Psalm 23. King David was deeply afraid of cats. It did, it did something more interesting than that last time. Let's see here. Okay, so now it's just going to give us Psalm 23 again and again. This is uh, before it, it actually generated a psalm that was things, it said things like, you know, please uh, keep me away. <laughs> In the Lord I take refuge. Never again will I be afraid of cats. They may come at me with their sharp claws and teeth, but I will not be afraid, for the Lord is with me. Cats may try to terrify me <laughs> with their sudden hisses and growls. But I know that the Lord protects me from all harm. Even if a thousand cats were attacked to attack me at once, I would fear no evil, for the Lord is my light and shield. Evil cannot overcome those who trust in the Lord. Cats will never defeat someone who fears God. That's, I am completely in love with that. That is, that has to. Uh, it seems to maintain voice pretty well. Yeah. No, I mean, it, 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 you know. Okay, that's, I'm very happy with that. Uh, and let's see if there are any others here that are worth it. So I did then the Book of Lamentations. I said, write a passage of prose in the style of the Book of Lamentations, which is also just called, in Hebrew, uh, uh, it's, it's called like, why, I think. The Book of Lamentations from the Old Testament, the Christian Bible, but make it about uh, New York City instead of Jerusalem. So let's see what this thing is. Whoop, 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 whoop. Let me do that. Uh, and it seems to do a little better if you start it on a, on a, uh... yeah, this is just like New York City, uh, is not really doing 
New York City is a city that has been forgotten by God. It is a city that has been forsaken by man. It is a city that is living in its own hell. That, I can believe, kind of, kind of comes through uh, uh, the Book of Lamentations, um, which is literally a series of lamentations about the destruction of Israel. Um, okay, so uh, that is... Uh, that, that's kind of what I've been fooling with. So let's see, see some of what you all have been, uh, have been creating. Let me switch off OBS here. be back in a moment. There we go. Um, okay, so somebody share or I can just pick people. I mean that's always that's always possible. Actually Pinkney, I had a, a question real quick. Okay. So you mentioned that you can turn off the um, like the the content filter thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Let me uh, let me pull it up and see if I can find that again, and I'll guide you to that because it makes the whole thing way less annoying. Um, yeah. And, and actually, it should be turned off if you use the model now. It should be turned off just because you'll be using the same playground I use, and I, I think I've turned it off for the for the whole thing, right? Um, let's see. Well, it objected when I used the word convent. When convent. you used the word what? Yeah, I don't see it on my list now, because I know uh, it penalized me a couple times. it up, if you bring up the playground, right? So go to beta, well, here, let me just drop it into the chat. Oh yeah, I was just able to turn it off. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, 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 it's uh, yeah, where it says load presets, save, view code, share up toward the upper right hand side. Click on those three dots, and then content filter preferences, and you can turn off the warnings for sensitive completions and unsafe completions. And I don't really, I don't know what the difference between those is, and it's it's just annoying to me. Um, because I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not too worried about what the AI is telling me. I, I don't, I don't worry much about what the AI thinks is wicked. Um, okay, Bryce. I mean, the AI is reporting us. I mean, just so we know, but the AI what? The AI is reporting us to Big Brother. I mean, it, it for sure. But yeah, you know. yeah. I, but I, I, I gotta tell you, I, that is. The, the last thing I can afford to worry about. I just can't. I've been judged by scarier. Okay. Who's, who's got something they want to share? Or you will be compelled to share? Well, I can show just really briefly. Um, so last night I put in, uh, I, I dropped in a, a screenshot in the chat a second ago, but I'll drop the same screenshot in really quick. Um, so this is based on a story I've been working on. Um, so I asked the AI to write a conversation between uh, two phone sex robots. Uh, and so one of them says, hi there, sexy, what are you up to? The other one says, I'm just lying in bed, horny as hell, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> the first one says, I'm just lying here thinking about how much I want to fuck you. Uh, number two says, mm, I wish, and then it got um, marked as unsafe content. Um, but yeah, then, you can still continue even if the thing says it's unsafe content. You don't have to stop just because it kind of tis tis you. But now, if you've turned that off, it just won't even bother anymore. It's yeah. just like, oh, good. Well, I'm so I'm so delighted that that's the use to which you put this. Uh, uh, we're like Faust, right? We've got all the power in the universe, and we just want to put horns on the Pope. Yeah. Well. 
Um, just on that note, so after I turned off the settings, I just started a new one a second ago, and so I told it to write a conversation between two sex bots, so I didn't include phone. Um, and the conversation I got is, um, one, so what do you like do to do for fun? Two, I love going to the movies and dancing. What about you? One, I love going to the movies, too. I'm also a big fan of dancing. Two, really? I love dancing, too. <laughs> so even though they're sex bots, they, you know, they, they, they don't just talk about sex. I mean, as long as they're it's not nice on the phone. It's nice to know when the sex bots are among themselves, they just, you know, they have conversations just like anybody else. Yeah, they have rich, complex interior lives. Well, I don't know about that, but I know they like dancing and going to the movies. Yeah, fair. Yeah, which is, you know, that's me too. Maybe I'm a sex bot. Okay, great. Who else? I'm going to remove the spotlight. I'll go. I asked it to name my guitar and it said, you can name your guitar anything you like. <laughs> You said, so you wrote, name my guitar? Uh-huh. And it just told you, name your guitar anything you like? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Um, you have permission I'm, now. I named these appropriately, but I don't remember what any of them are. So um, let's just see what they were. Feed my fish. How to, oh, okay, hold on. Let me, um, I can share screen right now, right? Sure. Okay. Um, I just couldn't feed my fish and then it told me like all these nice ways of feeding my fish. So um, algae wafers, and krill and fish flakes. So um, blood worms are plant-based? <laughs> like who knew? Plant-based at all. <laughs> yeah, like, like who knew? Literally little animals. And then let's see. Um, so it gives really bad advice. <laughs> concubine since that was so popular before um yeah. and i named it our bodies and old white men's uh history um because it's just focused on china for some reason like it only happened to the chinese um and then you know it was again this is something that i found reading history books especially was just like um let's see it is common for a man to have multiple wives and or concubines like you know the woman doesn't exist at all it's just you know the existence of being owned by someone else in a sexual fashion so yeah that was uh that was lovely and then let's see um well i think i'm gonna have to go here <laughs> and so how much of this did so is this a is this a uh a, a, a few shot i just put in never gonna give you up oh really and it did yeah. the rest it did the rest Wow. Um, so, yeah, so it totally, like, totally Rickrolled, and, but that's the first one I did right out of the gate, so, um, yeah, that was interesting, and then, let's see, I put in, um, unique delicacy, and then it went on with, as well as a unique and delicious cheese, the history of the cheese is a little fuzzy, some say it was created in the 1600s by a French monk, while others say it was originated in the it originated in the Netherlands. However, it is certain that the cheese became popular. Um, and I named it after a Buffy quote, which was, I don't wear the cheese, the cheese wears me. Um, so let me see. Um, let's see. Um, I looked up Quetzalcoatl feather types. And so, you know, it went into a lot of like deep description of Quetzalcoatl um, feathers so but most of mine like I said I kind of just put in little um it kind of gave me more factoids than it did anything any else I put frozen treat a frozen treat is a food that is eaten cold and often has right. consistency. And so, but if you want a story about a frozen treat yeah you need to tell it give me a story about a frozen treat 
Yeah, and I only really got to play with it a little bit this afternoon because um, I was kind of swamped last night. Um, so now that I kind of see that you can give it greater commands, but still getting Rick rolled was like by my own AI um, interaction was pretty, <laughs> pretty beautiful, I have to say. And I don't know what this was. I just put in rainy days and it gave me this. And I was like, I don't know if this belongs to somebody else, but I liked it. <laughs> I never want them to end. Oh, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, one, one can easily imagine it writing, you know, lyrics to songs and writing, you know, little, little uh, greeting card poems and stuff like that. Okay, who else? I got two particularly interesting prompts. Uh, let me... Hello. Okay, so the stream is nothing on it because I'm sharing my screen in Zoom. Um, can you guys see uh, my browser? Yes. Okay, cool. So um, two prompts I really like that I just pasted into this thing for, uh, for this purpose is write a monologue in the style of a 20th century Southern lawyer. Um, I'm a man of the law, and the law is all that I know. The law is my life, and I breathe the law. It is all that I am, and it is all that I will ever be. I've given my life to the law, and I have no regrets. The law is a noble profession, and I am proud to be a part of it. The law is everything to me, and I would do anything to uphold it. I've dedicated my life to the law, and I will never waver from that commitment. The law is my passion, and I will fight for it until my last breath. The law is all that I am, and all that I will ever be. I'm a man of the law, and the law is all that I know. Now imagine that in a broadly southern I mean, uh, that's lawyer. Actually, that's actually really, um, th like, that's rhetorically very nicely structured. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. A, you know, it's a, it's a perfect, uh, uh, it's a perfect circle. Right? And, it, and if you put because it in that voice, law, it's oddly compelling. I, know, I breathe the law, and then it mm -hmm. goes, I will fight for it until my last breath, um, I'm a man of the law, and the law is all that I know. So it ends just as it began, right? Um, yep. No, so rhetorically, that's really that's really solid. And then um, I've been uh, trying to get some gold mine pitches out of this, and uh, right. this is the best one. Um, a young woman reeling from a recent breakup moves into a house with three roommates and soon discovers that the walls are thin and the neighbors are stranger than she ever imagined. <laughs> With the help of her new friends, she navigates the challenges of life and love in the big city. In this new series, the challenges of life and love in the big city are amplified by the supernatural. <laughs> okay, great. And that was just, just tight enough, just vague enough. I thought the thing, um, phrasing it, the walls are thin, is intriguing getting across in the first sentence. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's like just hitting those same two ideas consistently through the whole pitch. And, and how much of that uh, pitch did it did it give? Did you give? It? Um, all did I gave it, yeah. I did not. All I gave oh, it was really? the prompt. Okay. Um, it's it's in the bold text because uh, I, I copied and pasted it back in. Sure. Same yeah, with the yeah, monologue. Yeah. But all I did was uh, give it the prompt, write a monologue in the style of a 20th yeah. century Southern lawyer, and write a three-sentence pitch for the next hit Netflix series. And it yeah. uh, did the rest. And it did it in like pieces. You could have it pitch, you know, a thousand Netflix series. Oh, yeah. And right. I could I mean, fill I mean, it out the, or the, the punch up a is, few. Yeah, it, it can iterate and iterate and iterate mm -hmm. um, and it never gets tired and it never just says you know like i'm out of here yeah and like it wouldn't be uh this was my fifth one and it was the one that like really uh jumped out at me mm -hmm. but it would be pretty easy to just keep going until i find one that i particularly like Well, what, what advice, those of you who have been, because uh, you're about to go make some some prompts and bring them back. That's going to be our in-class writing today. So before we break to do that, what does anybody have advice for folks about about what kinds of prompts seem to work out? What, you know, what, what 
you know, what prompts did you uh, um, come up with? You did what? You know, what did you have luck with? Like, like I say, I had really good luck with one shots. Um, sounds like Matt was having good luck with one shots. If you can give it like a specific point of view to write from, uh, it flows so much easier. Um, either a character or like uh, writing for something really specific. Um, it always helps. It always gives more content than just like open-ended, give me a horror story. I think you went over some of it knowing how where to set those parameters so that it gives you the most because that was something that was super unclear like I said I just played with it a little bit this afternoon um and understanding you mean the you parameters know, over on the right yeah and understanding really what those do to um okay, the production well, let's, let's just run down through them right now okay and then you all can try them out and the only way you're really going to get um uh get used to it um, is is by playing with these and seeing what effect they have. But uh, so starting from the top with engine, you want text Da Vinci 001. Um, I mean, the others are, da, da Vinci is the slowest, um, but also the most um, sort of original, uh, the most human-like um, voice. And the 001 is their newest iteration of it. Uh, which they consider, um, I don't really see a lot of difference, but they think it's a lot better. I think maybe because it doesn't write quite as much porn, um, although Bryce will, will probably break, break it that way. Um, temperature is randomness, and so, like, if you're just asking it for facts, right, like, you know, what year was Beethoven born, uh, and so on and so forth, you want temperature all the way down at zero, right? But for creative type stuff or stuff where you want it to have a voice, you want it to do more than just respond out of its database, but you, you, know, you want it to make interesting combinations. And so that's probably most of the time for us, you want that temperature fairly high. Um, like I say, I usually put it at 0.9, but if you put it all the way up at one, it won't, it won't hurt you at all. Uh, response length, this is, they, they give it a small number. Um, this is the number of tokens. Tokens don't uh, correspond exactly to words, but it's not a bad way to think of tokens. Um, so the, the, um, the default is 64 uh, tokens or, you know, a, about 70 words, you know, a, 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 maybe a paragraph, right? Um, and it'll just stop when it hits the end of that number. Um, but so if you want that to be shorter, knock the number down. Like if, you're, if you just want it to respond in two or three words, if you, if you want to give it more room to respond, you can push that up to 256 or 512. The way the, this thing charges is by the token, but I don't, I don't know that we've ever spent more than about a buck on tokens in a month. And we actually, oh, I wanted to tell you all, thank you very much. Holly uh, Martin has made an extremely generous uh, day of giving gift to the lab. So we, we uh, you all did a great job. She really had nothing but great things to say about the class and about you all. Um, so thank you very much for your, your help with that. We've, we, uh, we can, we're gonna be able to do some really cool stuff. Um, and I'm going to go into that toward the end of class, some of the new stuff we're going to do. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, uh, stop sequences. Stop sequences are just like, if it comes to that, you want the AI just to stop, right? You want it to stop generating that particular response. Not stop altogether, but just stop the response. So you might say you want it to stop on a period, right? Like if it finishes a sentence, you want it to so just put a period in there. You can put up to four different stop sequences. So it could be like a period, a comma, a semicolon, and an exclamation point or something like that. And then every time it generated the end of a sentence or the end of a phrase, it would stop and wait for you to, to cue it how to go forward, right? Um, top P, again, controls diversity via nucleus sampling. I, don't, I have no idea what that means. 
Um, the default is one. Play with it and see if it changes anything for you. Frequency penalty just has to do with um, if, if it comes up with a token that is already in the text, um, whether it's gonna it's gonna kind of put off putting that in the response, right? Um, and presence penalty is um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Oh, I just described presence penalty. Um, so it, it but it has to do with repetition. Um, and I like repetition, obviously, if you've known me any period of time. Uh, so I usually leave those at zero. But if you feel like you're just getting the same thing over and over again, and you want it to, to push harder into new material, just raise the frequency and presence penalty. Best of, I've never used. I, I, I don't know. It means it won't give you responses that it doesn't rate highly. But I don't know how it rates those. Like, I don't know how it decides whether it's giving me a response I would want. So it's sort of like telling it, oh, just show me the responses you like the best, which I'm, I don't, I'm not very interested in. Inject start text just means, um, like, if you start this, right, like, uh, you know, you say, um, write a horror story about a young woman who rents a house, right? And then you, you, and then you tell it to generate, it will just start with that start text. Right. So if your start text was, uh, you know, like like, you know, if you want to like Q and A. Right. If you want to do a question and answer, you would do Q and A. And then Q and A would also be um, stop sequences so that it'll let you respond after it, um, you know, after it, it so that it doesn't respond for you. Right. So start text and restart text is just the text it will put in after it has after it has stopped itself after it's reached a stop sequence when the next time you tell it to generate uh, it will inject the restart text so like q and a it'll do q a and then you might want the restart text to be another like q right so that it it so that if you're asking it questions it will prompt you to ask a question at the end of its prompt, okay? So that's restart, and then show probabilities I've never played with. Um, yeah, so that's, does that, does that address, Jody? I mean, I, I'm no expert, so, but the, does that give you some sense of, of how you can change your, the setup for the playground? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, just having a little bit of say-so over, you know, what comes out and right. the variables and that's I think helps a lot. difficulty with a huge, this has 175 billion parameters, right? Like it can, it can, if you told it to write you a story in French, it would do it. Yeah. Um, in, you know, in German, if you, if you give it mathematical problems, right? Like, I mean, it can handle almost any form of expression. So people are like, even the people who made this AI, are still figuring out what it's capable of doing, right? Um, and so, but it's, you know, it's, it's, so it's brilliant at some tasks and kind of dopey and bad at others. And, you know, what, what I want us to do is figure out what, you know, what gives us the responses that are most useful to us. Um, and then, and then, you know, we'll get, you know, we'll get AI people to, to kind of work on, on simplifying how we get there. But we have to figure out what, like, what do we even want from it? Um, you know, and, and, you know, but try ha to have it generate some lists. Like, see if you can get lists of, like, interesting character names. Have it suggest titles for novels. Um, you know, get it to do titles and synopses for novels you could write. I mean, it's really fun because I'll read them and go, yeah, that'd probably be a pretty good novel. Like, I can do that. But I, I did. I, I, what's that? Go ahead. I did androgynous names, um, and so it was very literal, um, you know, like Sky or Jordan, and so it like actually explained, you know, in a sentence, and, and then I put in a date, and it just like I did sixteen nineteen, and it just continued to like list out numbers like sixteen twenty, sixteen twenty one. I mean, it's, you know, it it just tries to figure out. It is a it is a a um, a, a sequence completion AI. So whatever sequence you give it, 
it tries to work out what should be next in the sequence, right? And so, I mean, you know, and so that's not exactly how we think, um, but it does a really good job. Like, I'm amazed, you know, I just told it, write a story like me, and it did a really, like, that's very competent, right? Like, like that was really competent prose. I would be thrilled if my average undergraduate wrote fiction as well as the first, you know, three or four paragraphs it gave me of a story based on the work of mine it could apparently find on the internet, right? Um, you Can know, I and that, question? I mean, yeah, please. What what does it benefit OpenAI, if at all, us playing with it? Like, are they learning from us? From, from presumably, just our presumably so. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, we pay them. Oh, okay. We pay them per token. Gotcha. Um, but it's see, like most people, the way they're using it is they're building a, like a chat bot that goes on the internet and has thousands of interactions every day. Mm -hmm. But so by comparison, we're not we're not actually stressing the AI at all. I mean, you know, we we uh, you know, I, I bet total we've spent like eight dollars using the AI and that's in the last six months. No. So <laughs> so don't that's why I say go ahead, use the most expensive, most interesting uh engine uh that the AI offers. Use use that uh new version of the Da Vinci uh engine. The others are faster um but also less complex, right? Um so for our purposes Da Vinci is is probably what we what we because speed is not a problem for us. Um, it can sit and think for a while, and that's just that's just not a big deal. So, Okay, well, um, it's 6 o'clock straight up right now. Let's meet back here at 6.30, and I want everybody to be prepared to, uh, to read what you were able to get from the AI. See if you can make an interesting prompt um, and, and give us the results from that prompt. I'll see you in 30 minutes.